So what's supposed to matter? Do you really think it matters? Matters? Even when someone doesn't exist anymore? You mean when someone dies? Let's say you. Why me? What about you? We're sitting here now. Just imagine if it weren't us. That would be stupid. How do you know it's us? How do you know you exist? Because of you. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rolaine. Each episode of the Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. Just a note, whether the film is a classic or a more contemporary title, this will be an in-depth discussion that will include explicit plot details and potential spoilers. We are at episode 123, and we're back to Cole's choice. What are we talking about today? This is one that I've been waiting to talk about for a long time, and I love it as a choice to kick off my part of the new year, and that is Daisies from 1966, directed by Vera Chitilova and starring Yitka Cherhova and Ivana Karbanova. It was written by Chitilova along with Esther Krumbachova, who is also credited as doing the costume design, though I think her contributions were more in line with an art director, and also co-written by Pavel Juracek. This is a milestone film of the Czech New Wave, and when you begin to dive into all the connections represented by the people working here, you realize we have a lot of significant participants. And I've got a lot to catch up on with the Czech New Wave. Well, this film itself is about two young girls, both named Marie, that decide, since the world is spoiled, that they will be spoiled too, and they begin to engage in a series of anarchic pranks and exploits. Since you said you have a lot to catch up on, and in case there are other listeners that are in the same boat, I just wanted to offer some quick background on the Czech New Wave itself. Isn't it great that there's always a new frontier of cinema to discover, whomever always, you are? Always, no matter what your level of expertise, I feel like there's always something out there to further stretch those boundaries. And in this case, for any listeners who, for whom this might be their first time encountering these films and this movement, these films were made when the region was known as Czechoslovakia, and the time frame for the bulk of what is considered the new wave is the early to mid-60s. Now, the Czech version, it shares a lot of the hallmarks that you'll see in other new waves, like the French or the Japanese. There's a lot of specifically youthful energy. Cinema verite style shooting and other experimental filmmaking techniques. And most importantly, a uh, kind of a feeling of revolution. Because it comes at a time in the country's life when some restrictions were loosening. Exactly. And you can read that revolution in a couple of different ways. In some cases, it's just a dismantling of filmmaking traditions that came before. You have innovators that might feel hemmed in by a studio system, for example, and it all coincidentally comes to a head with a specific group of people in a certain time and place. A new wave can be more of an aesthetic revolution than anything else. But in the case of the Czech new wave, you're exactly right. As with some others, you have an undercurrent of more pointedly political revolution. When artistic expression is so tightly controlled by the government, you're bound to have these instances where the artists are forced to become more clever with their dissent, or they could just put it right out there and accept the consequences. The Czech New Wave had some of both of those instances, and one thing that makes this different from France or Japan, I think, was that extra level of subversion and how it was frequently couched in this deep black comedy. There is very definitely a bleak behind the Iron Curtain gallows humor sensibility at play in a lot of these films. Other themes you might see that are particularly Czech, I think, are these longer stream of consciousness monologues and a focus on the individual and their daily concerns rather than the welfare of the state. Finding a way to emphasize the condition of being a cog in this absurd machine without the censors catching on was a finely honed skill of some of these filmmakers, and they had to do it right under the noses of the authorities. There was no independent cinema the way we think of it. The majority of these filmmakers, they were studying together at FAMU, which is Prague's Film and TV School of the Academy of the Performing Arts, 
And by the way, Vera Chitilova was the only female in that class. And they were using state-sponsored resources for all of it. On one hand, that's great because a lot of experimental and diverse works are being subsidized. A lot of projects were fully funded, but then never shown until much later, if at all. But at least the filmmakers had the opportunity and the means to make them. On the other hand, if you're these filmmakers, you're not just trying to elbow out a space to do something more creative and get away from social realism. You are trying to get out from under the long shadow of Stalin's very specific socialist realism. Of this group of filmmakers, I would guess that Milos Forman is probably the name that most folks are familiar with, and that may be mainly because of his non-Czech films like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest or Amadeus. That's certainly the case for me. I haven't seen his Czech films. One that I know you're familiar with, Ivan Passer, who made Cutter's Way, which is a huge favorite. Absolutely wonderful. He just passed away recently, unfortunately. But he's definitely a favorite of mine from this, because in addition to Cutter's Way, there's a great film that I think everyone should see called Intimate Lighting, which is, I think, his masterpiece. And you've got Jan Nemec, who is kind of the guitar of the Czech New Wave. It really is a wide-ranging movement. It takes in all kinds of genres and techniques. I really wish, talking about how there's always something to discover, the second part of that for me is often, I wish I could have experienced it in real time to get a sense of this artistic groundswell, because that's another thing that it has in common with other similar movements. You can feel actual revolution bubbling up through the artistic community, and then in this case, it all comes to a head in the Prague Spring in 1968. And a lot of Czechs immigrated at that point, something like 300,000 to 400,000 people, including a number of artists. Vera Chitilova, though, was a person who stayed. And then I think that she looked on filmmaking as her mission at any cost. So within Daisies, where do you see that in the context of the Czech New Wave? Is it more interesting, more daring, more anarchic, or does it fit right in with other films that you've seen? Since I'm the novice here. It's sort of an outlier in that it is considered so crucial, but it is so different from the other films that are in that canon, I think. It is much less narratively focused and much more experimental than the great majority of the rest of what is considered essential Czech New Wave, which is probably why it's one of, if not my absolute favorite out of the group. So let's get on to the film itself. What I like about it and what you see right away, it's audacious to say the least. Subtlety, at least on the surface, is not its aim. So it opens with scenes of industry and war. It's the first thing that we're made aware of, this relentless grind of the machine. And then that is quickly followed by our introduction to our two main characters. And this too is idiosyncratic. They move like marionettes, and they are bemoaning the state of the world that they occupy, and their particular logic leads them to a particular terminal point. If everything is bad, we'll be bad too. <laughs> what do you think about that idea? I was just about to ask you the same thing. <laughs> what was your instinctive reaction to this right away? Both the filmmaking that you're seeing, all these techniques that are bombarding you right away, and then this thesis. Did it feel confrontational in its style or subject, or was it something completely different for you? Do you feel like they're looking for a built-in excuse for bad behavior, or did you feel just like I did, which is, sure, why not? <laughs> Probably a little bit of everything. Now, I specifically went in having no context for the film, not knowing what was going to happen, not knowing what it was quote-unquote about. And so I just decided I'll take this as it comes because I think that that spirit is established right away. The sound doesn't necessarily match the movement. The words themselves are interesting. How the two girls are presented on camera is interesting. And so I thought, okay, this does seem kind of reasonable. I don't necessarily think that they are enfant terrible, but I'm prepared to keep an open mind. The color itself right away is just truly amazing to behold. Well, stylistically, it's all over the place. You have these jump cuts between locations and settings, this kaleidoscopic color scheme with all these filters, this collage approach to editing. It's so much that when a quote-unquote normal color palette pops up, it's almost unsettling how striking that is. 
And by the way, the cinematography is by her husband, that's Yaroslav Kuchera, and they worked together at FAMU, and then a number of times afterwards, they closely built their relationship and their working life together. Well, all of these cascading looks and changes and that thing I was mentioning about how normal now feels so striking, I really feel like these instances, they're a nice lesson in the ease and usefulness of recalibrating our own baselines and expectations. You see that it doesn't take much to get used to more dynamic input. And it's not just visual experimentation. One of my absolute favorite moments in the film is near the end, and that's scored partially by typewriter and doorbell. It's a little musical interlude almost with those elements. It's a beautiful use of sound design. Everything feels up for grabs, you realize, with that. Does this assembly, though, feel nonsensical to you, or was there a method that you perceived in all of this madness? I think for any method, I would have to watch it again. I think I was still in that spirit of, or I know I was still in that spirit of, let's just see what's going to happen. It seemed clear to me right away that this was not a narrative, so I was just ready to go along. What I get out of repeated viewings, and I think what you may arrive at too in this case, is I get a strong sense of there being a real absurd logic to things overall. You have this frantic cutting away the surface to reveal what's underneath, and you just have to adjust yourself. I think of this as an example. Say you take a map and you fold it. Now you take a pin and you poke a hole through it at your location. You've now created a direct line between where you are and the new place where the pin comes out on the other side. It makes that kind of through the looking glass sense. You to just me. blow on my mind over here. <laughs> it's so frenetic. It's super fun. It's fashion forward, which is another great element. And thanks again to Esther Krumbachova. The logical structure of the film for Chitalova herself, I read, was one of form following function. She says the film is destructive because the subject is destruction. So it all goes together, hand in glove, glove wielding a mallet to smash things with. And it seems like there would be enough to destruct here, to destroy, because in that moment, when they look from their apartment to the outside world, that's just gray, and it looks like people are just stomping around. I can't imagine what that would have felt like, but it would have seemed like whatever's happening here is wonderful, and the outside world is the thing we must change. And there was an interview with Yitka Cherhova, and she mentioned that they were examining this idea that society was incredibly decadent, and by decadent, she said, society doesn't advance. It hasn't evolved. It's desperately frozen, and I think you clearly see that in the moment when they look outside. I see it there. I see it in everything. Absolutely. Especially in this framing device that they use, where they go on date after date with these older gentlemen. It's like they're subverting all of that from within, using it to their own satisfaction, turning it all to their own ends. The way they look, the way they act, subverting these ideas of femininity. And I knew right away that the gentleman's no gentleman. He's just a funny daddy when he says, I don't like sweet things. Yeah. We see that in the first of these series of dates that they go on. I love the gusto with which one of the Maries eats as she is crashing the date, essentially. It wasn't <laughs> intended that they both were to go, especially having dessert first. Is having dessert first the Czech New Wave version of Gather Ye Rosebuds While You May? It's my version of <laughs> life. And so at the end of the evening, at the train station... One Marie sends the other to get a newspaper while she puts this old codger on the last train out of town to ditch him. It's hilarious. Can we just say that? The entire exchange is so funny. And we get to see this more than once. And it gets funnier and funnier as it goes in those particular instances. And at one point, one of my favorite points, they sort of go out on a date with each other, which serves as a nice contrast to all of the other dates because it underscores how they have much more fun together than with anyone else. They walk into this Art Deco jazz club, and there are a couple of good time Charlies here. <laughs> a couple of triple X rowdy girls. And I think it's really a brilliant piece of set design that their box where they're seated at the club looks like a miniature theater or a stage. They're born performers for one thing, so it's perfect for them. But it's also an indictment of all these normies in the crowd here, because the second their antics 
spill off of that stage and into their lives, they want to crack down on them right away. We like our anarchy, certainly, but only when we get to decide where and when it occurs. I think again about the ideas of femininity, and it's all great when you're cute and pretty Mm -hmm. and doing that, but then when you start to spill into our lives, not so pretty anymore. Yeah, because they can hardly be contained. And I really love this nod that comes later that's a straight-up Harpo Marx tribute when one of the Marie's cuts the date's handkerchief out of his pocket with a pair of scissors. (laughs) Game recognized game. (laughs) Did you get the sense as well that the female dancer that's actually performing, who's probably been paid to perform, she seems to be watching them, and I think she's thinking, can I join in? Oh, yeah. I would think anyone with any sort of spirit, they want that as well. The much more fun and exuberant version of the, I'll have what she's having. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, the Maries, they're really a great anarchic comic duo. They have such fantastic charisma and chemistry. I really think it shines through in every scene, no matter what they're doing. And I imagine they had an incredible amount of fun making this when I watch it. At least their performances convince me that they did. It feels like the Czech feminist cannonball run. Also, they're non-professionals, which you know I love. They each just made a handful of films. I think the thing that affects me the most about their particular chemistry is that it seems to pull responses from each other that wouldn't have come maybe with a different partner. It seems like there's a gleeful willingness to go farther that's sort of a mixture of playful one-upsmanship and also this confidence that you'll catch me if I go too far. And also something I think even deeply innocent as in Mm. we're making this up as we go along. Yeah, I can hear in my head them saying, oh yeah, can Milos Forman do this? (laughs) And so the end result, all of this anarchy, it's even more impressive to me because Chitilova would have had to submit this script in a form that got past the censorship committee and then change it all significantly on the fly, basically throwing out whatever script there was that was turned in for approval. It was made with the support of the state-sponsored studio, but then after it was finished, it was banned. I love this for, quote, depicting the wanton, unquote, which I don't disagree with at all, but in my book, I think that's a virtue rather than a vice. And depicting wasting of food, that being a huge crime, and that's also pretty anarchic when you think about how people were waiting in line for hours to get food at the grocery store. And then Chitilova She wasn't allowed to work in Czechoslovakia for almost a decade after this. Now, if you're an artist, is this sort of ban worth it to make this thing that you want to make the way you want to make it? And she still didn't leave. I want to say that again. She had opportunities to do so and didn't take them. Again, that mission. She is called the Margaret Thatcher of Czech film, and she says it's because she's merciless and impertinent. But not a horrible human being. Exactly. Not a war criminal. Is it worth it for you, though? I'm asking Erica. Do you make that sacrifice? I don't know that I would have the inner strength to do that. It seems like everything that came after, and she'll say this, was such an incredible slog. Her wanting to move so fast and never being able to. And daring to try to do the thing that she exactly wanted to do. It was never easy. Nothing ever came easy. She was actually recruited back into the film industry because they were losing money. During that time, she had to work under her husband's name. So it seems like this incredible slog that really maybe only she was born to do. What about you? Speaking strictly for myself, fuck yes, it's worth it. I knew you were going to say that. Otherwise, go sell Czech Tupperware. (laughs) Look at your tattoo on your forearm. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, we know the answer. So I guess it goes without saying that stakes are high. That's in the personal life of the filmmakers and then also in the film because we have an attempted suicide at one point on the part of one Marie, but she left the window open. Now, suicide is as much a ridiculous matter as everything else here. Nothing is to be taken seriously. Was this approach at all troubling to you, the presentation of that particular approach to mortality, specifically suicide? No, and I have to confess that I didn't realize that that was a suicide attempt, however much of a failure. It seems like in that way, death matters no more than anything else. Well, we're definitely through a sort of a looking glass here, and I love the chaotic nature of all of that. I am just riding that wave. 
It's comforting to me because I embrace this idea in real life. The most life altering thing that I took from this scene is that we just need to keep a big jar of pickles by the bed at all times. One of the Marie's at one point says, do you have any food in the house? And boy, I never felt more seen or heard. It did occur to me here, though, that one block that people might have that doesn't allow them to enjoy this is that they aren't even aware of how much they value the imposed structure of traditional narrative. They fooled themselves into thinking that that method of storytelling is what life is, that there's a beginning, a middle, and an end to everything, and we aren't just being yanked around by the universe's whim. Or maybe it's more a case of that's what they seek to escape that idea. How many things, though, have happened just today that you didn't expect? Ugh, yeah, one really <laughs> cruddy thing. We won't, don't need to go into it. Oh, okay. Well, just in general, that's, we know... Chaos is everywhere. So We've got two dogs. One of them is it. named Gibson, and he's <laughs> crazy, so we have it every day. Well, that led me to a couple of questions. Do we need to have a specific approach if we're going to watch a surreal film? Do you think to yourself, what's the point? Do you need a specific point? Do you need a specific mindset? Or can you greet the film on its own terms? And kind of judging from some letterboxed comments we looked at, <laughs> a lot of people do have a problem with that idea. I'm thinking about an experience that I had a couple of years ago watching Garlic is as Good as Ten Mothers, mm. the less blank film you introduced it to me. I realized the entire time that I was watching it, I was trying to figure out what am I seeing? What should I be taking away from this? because that's all through the lens of more traditional documentary. And I did initially wonder, what is the point of this? Not in a bad way, but just seeking one. So did I then work harder to try to discover the point, wondering what the filmmaker wanted me to take away from it, or looking for a different framework? Or did I just let go and participate? And I look at that against an experience we had more recently going through that Pioneers of African American Cinema box, within those ethnographic films, they're pretty explicit titles, so I'm a fairly literal person, I then know what to expect. So if I'm being really honest, I probably lean towards more kind of tell me and then show me, but this really made me work in a different way and I enjoyed it so much. I certainly never got angry about the experience or was shaking my fist at the screen. Well, some people certainly do. Because... If you like this, you probably like <laughs> Selena Julie go boating. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Meanwhile, we see this come up on another date, their fifth one that they mentioned. They put this guy on the train. And one criticism that I hear come up occasionally when I'm doing reading is that they are unnecessarily cruel to these men that are their dates. <laughs> Screw you. <laughs> what did these guys do to deserve being treated like this? Ask a number of middle-aged white men on the internet. <laughs> Is there anything to that question at all? Does one group disproportionately bear the brunt of their hijinks? Well, yes, and I don't have a problem with that <laughs> at the same time. It seems like if we're looking at mechanisms of the state, yes, I'm fine with them being dismantled. Truly, I thought of them more as hoping to solicit some kind of prostitution, so I don't really feel badly for them. Yeah, I think we have to consider who these men are standing in for, because who more than older men had their hands on the reins of the society that was being lampooned here? I'll tell you who my favorite one is, though. Can you guess? Uh, probably not. Go ahead. The one who then also gets off the train with them, and then they've <laughs> got to figure out something else. That's pretty funny. I think it would be really disingenuous to have any other type of character be the analog of those that you want to diminish and overthrow. They do steal from the older lady that's the bathroom attendant, by the way, and then their disruption in the club is an imposition on everyone, so I think they're equal opportunity pranksters. Ladies, do what you want when you want, because it's all ridiculous anyway. Did you feel any differently about the younger man who is, at least he professes, to love one of the Maries? I think that is a lot more of lust than love. I think he's also just angling for sex. Although it's a great scene, I really do love the playfulness of that butterfly montage. But I don't put him in any different category. I sort of took him as the one who's in love with himself mm -hmm. in his own words more than anything. Almost kind of a little bit of a stand-in maybe for her fellows at the New Wave. 
Well, there is definitely an eroticism to this. This is a great scene to talk about this. Do you feel that too, right? It felt more puckish than mm. that to me because it seems like the eroticism is supposed to be implicit because there's nudity, because she's being playful with nudity. It's more than that to me. I really take great delight in their consumption and the way they do that and their disregard for boundaries. That's a sexy combination for me. And we do have that beautiful, playful thing where all that stands between one Marie and nudity is an array of butterflies. And then there's definitely the inference of the quid pro quo with these men they go on dates with. They expect a sexual dividend for their perceived investment here. But it turns out that these men are the ones that are repeatedly expertly exploited and then thwarted at every turn and then dismissed. They have turned all this sexual expectation on its head. Yes, good point. I think unexpected eroticism, not the traditional means that we might be used to. And then there's one scene that we just can't ignore in this part of the conversation, because as ridiculous as everything is, they do say, let's do something big at one point. They want to make a statement sometimes. And in this case, their statement is cutting up their food with scissors for this wacky barbecue while everything burns all around them. And the phallic nature of the food that they chop up can't be ignored, I don't think. It's a series of sausages, pickles, bananas. Does this feel to you like a slightly more overt message than bad table manners and putting their old dates on the next train out of town? Possibly. It felt like they were making everything into bite-sized pieces so that everything can be consumed. Yeah, again, how do I get invited to that barbecue? I think you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but let me ask just to get some clarification. Some of that aforementioned criticism that I talked about of their character, it doesn't hold much water to me. I never found myself annoyed by them. How about you? I didn't either, and I felt like I was stepping back enough. I was going with the flow enough to like them or not care about them or not be interested in them or be charmed by them in equal measures, depending on what they were doing. For their own sake, I had no antipathy toward them as characters. I was just excited to see what was going to happen next. I didn't either. And I think in my case, it comes from never perceiving myself as their target in any way. I'm on their side the whole time. And I didn't see them as my analog either, so I didn't feel like I needed to really examine myself that much. I do think that they were designed to have at least a touch of that unappealing characteristic, though. The audience was at least sometimes supposed to find them obnoxious. And I think that they were even supposed to feel that way about each other occasionally. Best friends, sisters, lovers, comrades in arms... How did their relationship specifically strike you? Can you define it by any one of those things? It is a combination of those things. Well, I said that they're not my analog, but in my 20s, I was known to cavort around town in outfits doing things. <laughs> so maybe I'm a little bit closer to them. I loved the relationship. I thought it was fascinating and seemed, even in a non-narrative structure, to be pretty realistic. Making each other laugh, but also annoying each other and wondering about the ends of things. And Vera Chitilova talked about showing people as she believes they are, both primitive and aesthetes at the same time. Yeah, I don't think I put it in one particular category, aside from I felt like they were profoundly connected. And that's demonstrated so simply and perfectly in that scene in the bath, the thing we did for our opening scene, when they're talking about that. How do you know you exist? Because of you. We define and completely validate each other to the point that without each other, we might not be. And it seemed odd going back to that scene where one of the Maries is with potentially the younger lover and the other Marie is not there. And it's odd because they become one unit to me. Mm -hmm. I really feel like their connection, in fact, it may be the only thing that belies their stated philosophy that nothing means anything. You can see just how much it means in dozens of little ways. It's their playful mockery of each other, the way they borrow things from one another, their names, obviously. But then by extension, their destructive boredom is also bound to be directed at each other too, right? Because if they are that unit, do you think that's an inevitability? I do, because I don't think they're living in a utopia. Mm. Even though they're barbarians, <laughs> they are not ideals. And so this does, I think, have to come to some sort of an end just to find another beginning. 
yeah, that idea, it interests me so much. And then there's this suggestion that these characters are at least partial biographical sketches of Chitilova and Krumbachova. Oh, I really hope that's true. It makes me love them and this film so much more. It makes me happy to think that the story on screen, as much as there is a story, it mirrors their personal relationship and the filmmaking process for this. It's kind of hard for me to see that with Vera Chitilova because she doesn't seem as impish as I think these characters are. You Again, that Margaret Thatcherism. Yeah, you have to have some of that, though, to come out with this, it feels like. I guess so. She's just been described in, in, by herself in such harsh and strict terms, choleric being one of them. So not knowing as much about Esther Krumbachova, though she did co-write Valerie in her Week of Wonders, so mm -hmm. I can see her. Well, I just picture them as totally freewheeling. Can't you see one Marie taking the other out in her homemade taxi to fix the other one's stiff neck a la the little rascals? I can. I guess I think more of Vera as the scissors. Yeah. What you need is a little excitement, she would tell her. <laughs> I'm just going to imagine that that's how Chitilova and Krumbachova got to the set every day. Let's do it. Yeah, let's go with that. Moving in another direction here. In a way, I feel like this is the very definition of art house film. Maybe even more than your Bergmans and your Fellinis. Those seem to be more linear and approachable. Though this is not as free of structure as you might think. For example, if you use these dates that they go on as an anchor, there's a repeated behavior that brackets these more free form and to me, more important interludes where they discuss all the things that are important and completely unimportant to them. And then these are weighty topics, too, that they get into. Death, even suicide, the consumption that they're always engaging in, how they're perceived, if they're even seen at all. Yeah, that idea that you're not registered, so you can't work, and you are invisible, maybe due to your gender, your age, any number of these characteristics that they share. And then in between, and even during, those somewhat grounding, repetitive structural elements, it's a madhouse. It employs these unpredictable cuts, every color filter under the sun, sound, like you said, that isn't even consistent with what's happening on screen. I just love that there is so much instability built into the film itself. It means that I can't be a lazy viewer. I have to be ready all the time. I have to be an active participant in this process, you have to be ready to assume that role if this movie is going to work for you, I think. I'm going to plump for a second to being the lazy viewer and that that's still an enjoyable experience, but you get a lot out of it if you think about it. It probably also helps if you agree with their ethos that one should try everything, exclamation point. Grab the scissors and cut off your limbs and your heads. It doesn't matter. For what it's worth, I would watch a dozen films with these characters. Krumbachova, she said that a fair amount of this was improvised or written and constructed at the very last minute, and I think you can definitely pick up on that energy, and I think it's a huge benefit to the film. One of the most appealing things about watching it the first time is this feeling that anything can happen. And they encounter surprises like that too. About two-thirds of the way through the film, they encounter a gardener at work, and it feels like this is the first quote-unquote real thing that we've seen in quite a while and he doesn't respond to them, as if he can't even see them. Being who they are, they try to be provocative, they steal a bunch of corn, but nothing. They become completely aware of their invisibility. They're not getting a response, which is really what they crave a lot of the time. So as a result, they are forced to attempt to define their own existence and what it means to be in relation to other people. I think it's a bit of a sobering moment for them. Because my knee-jerk reaction was to take him as a farmer as opposed to a gardener. I think of those being two mm. different things. One being paid, possibly, state-run. So this mechanism, again, of the state, however benign, that you are invisible to because you don't have those same credentials. Again, you don't work. You're not registered. So they gather themselves a little bit after this interlude where they are questioning themselves and they arrive at one final banquet hall, and there's a brief admonishment at the beginning to go carefully so that no one notices. And then she puts her whole hand in the dip. Yeah, we know that's not their style, which makes that warning all the more funny. And then it's chaos. Gluttony, a food fight, literally swinging from chandeliers. It's glorious. But I do have one question. Why do you think this meal is shot so unlike 
any of the others from above at an odd, almost surveillance camera angle. Surveillance is what occurred to me, that finally someone has noticed them, and that this is the single most important thing that they could do. Yeah, it definitely feels like an intrusion of the state, because any last meal, quote-unquote, before repentance and then execution is observed by the proper authorities. Now, Chitilova herself, she did always insist, even when the censors couldn't get to her anymore, that she intended this to be at least a mild indictment of these characters, that evil might come just as well from bored teenage girls as battlefield generals if they have no outlet for these unfocused energies and appetites. Does that intention of Chitilova's make you rethink your interpretation at all? I think at every moment, even though I do say that I'm lazy, she is expecting us to think about things, to critique everything and everyone, and that that shifts. And so you think you like this? Well, what about this? Do you still like that person? I also think about another phrase used to describe her diabolically crazy, irascible, aggressive. I think the aggression is what's so interesting right there. I think again about the audience that didn't get to see this, how incredibly shocked and appalled they would have been by that display. But appalled by the actions of those characters, not this amazing banquet set out that they would have no access to. Okay, so they've gorged themselves until they can't even move practically. We come to the end and it's putting things back in order. To be good and hardworking is what's going to make us happy now. They are reciting this rote propaganda. And it's really so ridiculous them putting things back to rights. Moving one plate over as opposed to really cleaning anything up. And I love this master stroke. I'm assuming by Esther Krombachova. The costume choice here, when they become basically these brainwashed robots, it is this elaborate kind of jumpsuit of trash that's amazing. Not just trash, but specifically for me, newspaper. Newspaper, yes. But trampled on newspaper mm. somehow. The refuse of words. I think you make a great point that there is no reassembling a broken dish. It's not going to be the same. It will even be, if you put it back together, a shadow of its former self, a parody of what it once was. And that's the trouble with being through the looking glass. There is no going back to normal once you have seen things from the other side. And then I love this final dedication. This feels very Chitilova to me. This goes out to all those whose only source of indignation is a trampled on trifle. I feel like, and I don't know if this is what you meant when she's always making you think, I feel almost like she's daring me to do something, like she is poking me in the chest with this final declaration. Because as I mentioned earlier, I was thinking so much about who is this party for mm -hmm. that they have crashed not for workers, not for regular people, not those people we saw slogging through the streets earlier, not the farmer who has made this food somehow, but for all of these nameless men that have been sent out on the trains. Well, by the time we reach this end, do you feel like the outcome would have been different for them, whether they capitulated to this or not? Does it do anything for them to have this exaggerated 11th hour conversion to the party line? It left me feeling really actually kind of desolate here. I felt like, oh, they're on their way to a gulag at this point. Yeah, I felt the same. I think it really makes it more tragic to me. I don't think it makes a difference to those in power whether you repent or not. So come out guns blazing like Butch and Sundance and you just make your mark. And uniformly, I think as a response to that, the establishment is just not going to know what to do. Like a lot of new wave entries from all over, this feels absolutely ahead of its time. So where I'm left after all of this happens, I have this feeling that the youth, the artists, they're all racing forward and the regime cannot hope to keep up with any of it or maybe even understand why anyone would want to. That's what I walk away with once all is said and done. So I know that I have a hole in my knowledge here, but I do feel kind of left behind I feel like this movie should have been shown to me in school, in experimental theater, in some place where it would have fit right in. Why didn't I know about it? I think that story is probably a little different for everyone. You come to things when you come to them. There is no way to dictate that. I think what keeps it out of the larger conversation, though, 
is something that you referred to earlier. I see a lot of people online that profess having a hard time getting a handle on this one. So most likely, if that's how the general public feels about it, it's not going to be taught very regularly. I've seen a lot of negative reviews of it on Letterboxd, for instance, especially citing that it's a plotless farce. It's devoted to antisocial behavior and anarchic consumption and nothing else to which my gut reaction is, and? It doesn't seem like you're offering criticism if you're stating the obvious, mm -hmm. if you're stating the reality. Now, was that any sort of hurdle for you to overcome in this viewing? Absolutely not. Do you think that gender plays any part of this? Oh, gender of the people working on it? Gender of whom it's portraying? Absolutely. And I think that pops up more often in another complaint that I see, that their antics don't come to more, ultimately. And this I can relate more to because there's a parallel for me between this response to daisies and something I didn't get the first time I watched it. This echoes, kind of, my reaction to Persepolis the first time I saw it. My initial reaction to one of the themes in Persepolis was disappointment in what I saw as a waste. You fight for this independence, you struggle and claw for personhood and individual rights, and then, when you get it, you spend it on boys and cigarettes and parties. I see a similar criticism of daisies in that it's frivolous. And it took me a little while to realize, you know what? Easy for me to say. I've never had social restrictions that way. I can't conceive of what a monumental victory it might be to have ready access to these things as a matter of course. So when I look at things like this now, I absolutely understand that frivolity and indulgence can indeed be revolutionary acts. And it doesn't need to be anything more than that. Not everyone has the luxury of frivolity. And no one has the obligation to spend their hard-won liberty on what you think is important as you are looking in from the outside. So we don't expect them to single-handedly or two-handedly dismantle the entire state from the ground up. Absolutely not necessary. We can just enjoy the ride. Another important distinction that I think some of the more harsh critics fail to see about this or even acknowledge is the difference between these characters being dumb and then affecting dumbness for a purpose, fabricating this tapestry of silliness as an artistic statement, as defense against incursion, as just a comforting security blanket. If it looks empty-headed to you, I'm going to suggest that that is probably just a cursory view that you've taken. Someone in particular did call it that, P.S. Do you know who said that about it? James Toback. <laughs> probably, but <laughs> our old pal Bosley Crowther. Oh, Lord. He's one of the guys on the train, for Pete's sake. <laughs> Here's what I would like to envision. Bosley Crowther interviewing Vera Chitilova and asking her if she was a feminist, if she considered herself to be a feminist. And she would respond, you ask stupid and pointless questions, <laughs> which is a direct quote. And then she drop kicks him out of the ring and smashes him with a chair. Absolutely. And she also said, don't keep to the rules, break them. I'm an enemy of stupidity and simple mindedness in both men and women. And I've rid my living space of these traits. I don't know what you're saying about her seeming kind of brusque. <laughs> well, how about we eliminate all this silliness and get to the recommendations? What do you have for us? Well, mine's kind of silly. Sorry. <laughs> I started with a list of movies released worldwide in 1966, and there were some amazing ones, a number of which we've already talked about on the show. Andrei Rublev, The Battle of Algiers, for example. But I thought back again to how she described herself merciless and impertinent. And it made me think about another incredibly colorful experience, something you also introduced me to, and that is A Woman is a Woman from 1961. It was directed by Jean-Luc Godard and associated with the French New Wave. And I think it straddles that paradox of anarchy with tradition. There's this incredibly traditional motive underneath that is actually kind of maddening to me and maybe to other people as well. But with Anna Karina being awesome throughout, what is not to love? And it's a musical. The color is glorious and gorgeous and effervescent. Belmondo's in it. There's just so much to love here. How about you? Funny how we both instinctively went French with these recommendations, because initially I really wanted to recommend a film that you referred to earlier, Celine and Julie Go Boating, for this, because there may be no other film I know of 
that you can draw such a straight line between this and that. But I've already recommended it before. But do you like how I'm sort of sneaking it in? Right <laughs> Did here? you also pick another movie from 1966, Munster Go Home? No, I didn't <laughs> pick that. I went way, way back to the beginning of things. Well, sort of the beginning of things. And I am recommending Zero for Conduct from 1933, directed by Jean Vigo. It's based upon his days as a schoolboy, and it's about a group of youngsters that are planning an act of rebellion to get back at the teachers whose only functions seem to be crushing the boy's will and fattening themselves at the expense of the system. It's a major influence on the 400 Blows and is super fun to watch. I chose it for this because it also has a small group of rabble rousers. In this case, it goes from two kids to three to four that are intent on flouting convention through playful anarchy. It's one-third Little Rascals, one-third Lord of the Flies, and one-third The Grand Illusion as they come up with this plan to bust out of this oppressive conformity factory that this boarding school has become. There is one teacher that's on their side, and he is great with his chaplain impressions and drawing caricatures of the headmaster while doing handstands on his desk, and it also shares another element with daisies in that it has one or two nifty visual tricks. They're nothing as avant-garde, obviously, and they only occur a couple of times, but they add a nice dreamlike, whimsical air to the proceedings. Highly recommended to anyone who has ever daydreamed about their own miniature rebellion. So once again, that's two great recommendations. A woman is a woman and zero for conduct. And that brings us to the end of episode 123. First and foremost, we would like to say a special thank you to our newest Patreon supporter, Katie Armour. Thanks, Katie. We appreciate that very much. If what we do here is valuable to you and you would like to support that, we would certainly love for you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash magic lantern. The $5 a month level gets you access to a big backlog of bonus episodes and those come out on the Mondays alternating with regular episodes so you never have to go a week without new magic lantern in your life. If you would just like to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We also wanted to say a special thanks here to our friends Travis and Deanna Trudell. Travis does the complete podcast with another friend of ours, Matt Gasteyer, and we've been acquainted online for several years now. But since our last recording, we actually got to sit down with them for dinner in person, and they brought us these super cool handmade zines featuring some of our favorite women filmmakers. So thanks to them for taking time out of their vacation to hang out with us and for the awesome gift. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. We're on Twitter, at Lantern underscore cast. And I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. Laura Cannon and the Fatal Films Podcast. The Fine Gentleman at Fuds on Film. Josh Hornbeck and the Criterion Channel Surfing Podcast. Brian Sauer, Michael Muck Erdley, Keith Rich, Jesse Athey, Aaron West, Andy Wolverton, Tim Lego, Matt Gasteyer, Jeff Duncanson, Michael Cannon, and Ross McLeod. If you're sharing the show or talking about us, please make sure to tag us so we can say thanks. We are on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, just about anywhere you get your podcasts, you can find us. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review via any of those services, we would certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at the website magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. <laughs>